Marketing research is all about making better decisions. There's no magic recipe for marketing, so we do what we can until we reach an impasse. However, the more questions we ask, the more likely we're going to be asking what turns out to be the critical question. When I found this list of possible marketing research questions, I thought, how ridiculous. But I think it might serve as a useful exercise to go through these questions and ask yourself, would I be able to make a better decision if I knew the answer to this? For those questions which you think no, or not at the moment, skip those. For the ones that you think absolutely yes, keep those in mind as we go to the next slide. If you aren't the only decision maker in your firm, why don't you give the list of questions to the other decision makers and ask them to do the same thing? The question that gets multiple yeses should go to the top of your marketing research agenda. Sometimes the hardest thing in marketing research is to determine where can I start. There are hundreds of directions you can take and you never know how valuable the answers are going to be until you start to ask questions. In the previous slide we looked at far too many possible questions. Let's take one or two of them and follow them through the marketing research process. For this exercise, let's consider two sample marketing questions. One, who is currently buying your product or service? And two, why are other people not buying it? Let's also consider that we are currently successfully producing a horticultural product, wasabi, the Japanese horseradish. We know our marketing question, so we have satisfied our problem identification. Let's move on to background research. Background research. We could start by collecting popular press articles, industry reports, local reviews, online conversations, and even cooking books and magazines to find everything that's been said about wasabi. Within these publications, we could look at any mention of Australian wasabi, wasabi preferences, brands, and variations. If there are wasabi experts, we email them and add their thoughts to our growing collection of information. For question one, we could talk to friendly members of our supply chain salespeople and some of our larger customers. For question two, we could make a list of all the other available brands, imported products and substitute products. Data requirements. If the background research doesn't give us the answers we're looking for, we need to do the research ourselves. This means we need to think about the research we need to perform in order to answer the questions. This data could be in the form of the consumer attitudes or it could be sales projections depending on our research questions. For question one, we need to come up with some questions to ask our customers because we want to put together a profile of our customer base. For question two, the problem is less focused and we might need to talk to experts, customers of other brands or people that we think should be buying our product but aren't. Data availability. This follows on from data requirements and we start to look at whether the data we need to answer our questions is already available or do we need to collect it ourselves. If it's not available, this takes us to the next stage where we actually have to collect it. This doesn't have to be a formal process. It can be a casual conversations with customers, industry experts or other producers. However, if our data requirements suggest that we need to ask the general public or people that we have no current contact with, we might consider hiring a company to do the surveying for us. If a survey company collects the information for us, they'll probably provide a summary of the results. If we do the work ourselves, we'll have to think of ways to analyse the data. This also doesn't have to be formal. For example, we may start to see trends or consistency across responses early in the survey process. As soon as we see enough agreement to answer the research questions, we can stop. If we don't find agreement, it may suggest that we either need to ask different questions or the problem might be more complex than we first imagined. Finally, if we reach an impasse, there are dozens of marketing research companies who would love to have us as their clients, and if we have a clear idea of our research problem, it won't take long for them to understand what we're looking for. This graphic depicts the process involved in developing and launching a new product. However, it doesn't indicate the costs involved at each one of these stages. In fact, the early stages of a new product development can be relatively low in cost because they only involve time. More specifically, the time of people that are already working for us. Sitting around a table, we might be able to introduce 10 new product ideas and dismiss seven of them. So at the idea generation, idea screening and concept development stages, much of the work can be done in-house and it just costs us time. However, later in the process, the product design, test marketing and market entry stages are all extremely expensive and mostly performed outside by outside specialists. This means that any research that can eliminate a potential product before it enters those last few stages is going to cost us a lot less than the cost of a failed test marketing or launch. The difficulty is that most marketers take an optimistic view of how successful the new product could be and they don't see the negative research as a potential positive outcome or valuable money-saving result.